Good morning. My name is Cameron McElhenney and I serve as the Director of Training and Education for the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. I'd like to welcome you to NACOL's 2015 webinar series where today we will be discussing the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Before we officially begin, I would like to take care of a few housekeeping items. During the call today, all attendees will be muted. As soon as we begin, however, you will have the ability to type in any questions you might have for the speakers. When we come to the question and answer portion of the webinar, your questions will be asked and answered as they have been received. During the webinar, you may also send any questions you might have for me as the web webinar administrator in the same manner. At the conclusion of today's webinar, each of you will be given the opportunity to complete a brief survey on today's event. If you could please take a few moments to complete the survey, it will help us as we move forward with enhancing and expanding our webinar series. With our housekeeping duties out of the way, I would like to introduce you to today's moderator, Brian Butler. Brian serves as the president of NACOL and had the privilege of providing verbal testimony to the task force during their listening session on policy and oversight in Cincinnati last January. Brian? Thank you, Cami, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I think we are fortunate that this particular webinar is very timely given the release of the task force's final report uh, this past uh, Monday, uh, along with the President and the White House announcing a number of uh, important national policing initiatives, including a police uh, data initiative, uh, community policing grants, uh, research into accountability, mechanisms in policing, and partnerships between the federal government and police associations, research associations. And so the webinar today is, is very timely and we're very fortunate and honored to be joined by two of the task force members, um, Sue Rar and Tracy Mears, and uh, we'll do a more formal introduction in just a second, but the task force really was uh, an important event that uh, that occurred, and really it was more more of an than an event. It was really a, a process uh, that began last December, when in response to the events that were happening around the country, President Obama signed an executive order establishing the task force on 21st century policing, uh, and they had a, a very broad mandate which was to identify best practices and offer recommendations on how policing practices can promote effective crime reduction while building public trust, uh, which you know we know from years of, uh, of practice in civilian oversight that civilian oversight has an important role to play uh, in building public trust and strengthening the, the critical relationship between police and the communities they serve. Uh, so it is with, uh, with that, I will uh, point you to the task force website, uh, which you see the link to on your screen. It's housed in the uh, COPS office website, and you can find the final report link there. You can find more information about all of the members of the task force. You can find copies of all of the testimony, uh, both written uh, and oral, that was provided to the task force along with a host of other information and a, a copy of the original executive order signed by the president. So I encourage you to visit the COPS office website. Um, much of this information is also linked from the NACOL website. Uh, we have our own sort of mini president's task force uh, information uh, subpage uh, where we include copies of uh, NACOL's written testimony, which we provided for the building trust and legitimacy uh, listening session for the task force as well as a, a link to uh, a video of the testimony that I provided in the policy and oversight listening session in Cincinnati on January 30th. And then we, were, uh, we also posted testimony that had been provided by uh, NACOL members, past presidents, uh, and leaders in the field of civilian oversight, and, and those testimonies are, are also linked on our website. So uh, as I mentioned, we are very uh, fortunate to be joined by two members of uh, the task force, uh, Sue Rar and Tracy Mears. Uh, Sue is the current executive director of the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission. Um, and prior to that, she served as the King County Sheriff. 
actually, and she had worked, I think, for over 25 years in the King County Sheriff's Office. Sue really is a, a leader in the field of policing, uh, both Tracy and Sue, actually, you, you will see their names and hear their voices on radio uh, and talk shows and uh, all over the news uh, because they really are, I think, leading the, uh, the nation in, in terms of thought about how to think about policing as we uh, move forward and policing evolves. Uh, and Tracy is the uh, current, I want to make sure that I get the, her actual title here correct. It is the Walton Hale Hamilton Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Um, and I know that a lot of work that both Sue and Tracy did in their roles in the um, executive sessions for policing and public safety out of Harvard uh, have been sent out over the, the NACOL listserv. So hopefully you've had an opportunity to see some of their, some of their work. Uh, and so with that, I think I would like to um, turn it over to Sue and Tracy, and, and they're going to talk for about 20 to 25 minutes about uh, the task force and the process uh, and their experience with it, along with the report and recommendations. And then at that point, we will open it up to questions from participants. So, Tracy? Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning for those of you who, like Sue, are on the West Coast. Um, Sue and I talked about how it might be a good idea to introduce the work of the task force and um, we thought you might be interested in just hearing a bit about how um, our work was structured and how that structure actually is reflected in the task force report. Um, if you've had a chance to see the task force report um, or even if you haven't I'll tell you what it, how it had set up it's divided into six pillars um, these pillars were organized primarily by um, our co-chairs, Lori Robinson, uh, who's a professor at George Mason, and Charles Ramsey, who's the chief of police of um, the Philadelphia Police Department, as well as our executive director, uh, the president's task force executive director, Ron Davis, who also is head of the COPS office. Um, those six pillars are as follows, building trust and legitimacy, um, second, policy and oversight, which goes a lot to these issues of how to structure police use of force, among other things, um, third, technology and social media, fourth, community policing and crime reduction, five, training and education, and six, officer wellness and safety. And as Brian Buckner just mentioned, we then held uh, listening sessions across the country targeted at each one of these pillars, uh, hearing oral testimony as well as collecting written testimony from organizations uh, with particular interests as well as members of the public. I think it's also important to point out that while this uh, organization of the work around pillars helped to facilitate the uh, putting together of the report. We had an extremely tight timeline. Brian Buckner just mentioned that the work started in December. That's only formally. Our co-chairs were appointed on December 1st. The rest of the task force members, like Sue and myself, were not appointed until December 19th. And because of the holidays and the like, our work did not start in earnest until January 13th. So from January 13th until we handed the report to the president on March 2nd, I think the best estimate is that we had 57 days to work, um, which includes weekends. And believe me, uh, we did spend every day of the week working on this report. Um, so um, I think the only other thing I, I want to add before um, asking you know, Sue to offer her remarks is to say a, a bit about how the pillars fit together. The first pillar, building trust and legitimacy, um, the task force members considered the foundation of the report in that every other pillow that pillar that followed essentially was um, about shoring up 
um, that critical issue. It is difficult to have trust and legitimacy without good policy and oversight. For example, technology and social media can either support or undermine uh, trust and legitimacy. Training and education, of course, is critical to promoting trust and legitimacy. And the idea is that, of course, when these issues are present, trust and legitimacy, um, good community policing and actually public safety follows. Um, I think that's it. Sue, can you think of anything else I should add? I think that that, that, that was a great summary. Uh, I just I would underscore the accelerated timeline that we had because I think many of us would have liked to dive deeper into various issues, but that just wasn't an option with the timeline that we had. Um, I'll jump in, and I think Tracy's given a great um, backdrop. I'll just jump in with a couple of my observations, and then maybe Tracy can share her observations. A um, couple of things that stood out to me, because this task force was comprised of people from very different perspectives, from community advocates to a civil rights attorney to law enforcement leaders, union leaders, it was extremely powerful to have the opportunity to hear different perspectives, especially on the current events that are being um, talked about in the media. Uh, the other thing that stood out to me is how di very different policing is from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, there's a stark differences. And then being reminded that we have 18,000 different police departments in this country, each with their own unique culture that is influenced not only by the cops themselves, but the political structure that supports the police department. Um, the other thing that was really helpful to me is, frankly, listening to the testimony of over 100 experts. And I think one of the valuable pieces in the task force report is simply the list of witnesses. And I think if, if NACOL wants to dig into any area more deeply, um, that's like the bibliography on a thesis. There's tremendous, tremendous depth of expertise from our witnesses. Um, another thing that stood out to me from the testimony and the written documents was coming to grips with how damaging some of our crime strategies have been and, and how they have undermined public trust to the point where what looked like a, a good law and order crime fighting strategy actually backfired. Um, and I would also underscore when Tracy talked about the pillars, uh, listing trust and legitimacy as the first pillar, I think sent a very important message. And our intent was to convey that this is a foundation to better policing. And without this foundation, none of the other pillars uh, really can be as effective as one would hope they would be. So Tracy, I don't. You may want to share some of your personal observations as well. Yeah, um, I think building on what you just said, Sue. While there were incredibly diverse perspectives on the task force, um, you know, Sue's already mentioned some of the different roles. Let me emphasize uh, a couple of others. In addition to having uh, police executives and civil rights lawyers, academics, and the like. We also had a, a, a range in age spectrum and <laughs> facility, oh, point. social media, and you know, of course, as you just mentioned, geographic variation uh, and the like. We're extremely diverse, coming from many different roles, but there was complete unanimity um, in in the recommendations. Um, that's not to say that you know we all ar arrived at our unanimous opinions, um, you know, through a mind meld process. <laughs> you know, there was a discussion and we all learned from each other, but we are all 100% behind every single one of uh, the recommendations that you might read. And, you know, we learned only after the fact, um, after our work was done at this extremely accelerated pace, that not all presidents' task forces are as similarly successful. So, um, you know, we, we felt really good um, about our, our work. Um, I think I would want to emphasize three um, recommendations that um, I hope people pay uh, a lot of attention to. 
Um, the first two are in the first pillar, and um, the first one is actually the very first recommendation. Uh, and, and that recommendation has to do with a shift in law enforcement culture, embracing a guardian mindset uh, to build public trust and legitimacy. I can't emphasize how important I personally think that is. And I think Sue thinks it is too, since she has recently written a piece in um, the Harvard Executive Sessions on Policing series on this very topic. I believe Brian said um, it may be one of the pieces that was posted for you. I think much of the work and the recommendations that follow that particular one, which is number 1.1, um, are about making that shift. I want to emphasize that it doesn't mean that I think that, you know, all police are, you know, horrible, unlawful people. Um, you know, I have been listening a, a great deal to uh, what uh, police officers in particular, officers, uh, union representatives are, you know, feeling like they're under fire. Uh, I, I actually think what this recommendation is about is about making the job of those who have the right attitude uh, to make their job actually easier uh, and to do the job that they want to do um, for the public that they serve. Um, a second recommendation that um, I want to point out is a recommendation about the fact that uh, crime control uh, strategies can have negative consequences, as Sue just mentioned. Um, there's some language in, in the report that I think it's worth emphasizing and quoting, and that is, um, you know, crime reduction is not self-justifying. I think for too long, um, in recent years, law enforcement agencies have adopted a, an approach that supports that notion implicitly, if not explicitly. And if public trust is going to be pursued, we simply have to get away from the idea um, that crime reduction is self-justifying. Um, and a, a third recommendation I, you know, I'd like to point out, it has to do actually with um, officer safety and wellness. And, you know, that is that uh, this is recommendation 6.2, that law enforcement agencies should promote safety and wellness at every level of the organization. I, well, one of the things I think that's really interesting about uh, that I learned from this process is that um, police officers understandably sometimes feel as if um, their wellness, you know, I, I want to focus on wellness as opposed to safety, is sometimes lost in all of the conversations that we have about um, control and shaping of discretion or promotion of public trust and the like. And there are many things that um, we do that actually undermine officer wellness. It's a very stressful job and that has all sorts of implications, not only for the police officers, but the public they serve because um, hurt people can hurt people. And so we should an endeavor to make sure that we don't lose sight of um, officer wellness. I, I, Tracy, that is such an important point. I, I want to add on to that, that one of the dilemmas we have in not only civilian oversight, but some of the consent decree uh, events that I've been part of, we talk about creating more rules to tighten up the performance of police officers. And what I've come to understand is officers necessarily have to have broad discretion. Um, particularly if we want them to reduce the amount of force so that they can use their judgment about is there a different way for me to resolve this besides making an arrest. And if we want officers to exercise their discretion in noble and honorable ways, they have to be in a healthy state of mind. And sometimes the internal culture of police departments doesn't promote that the necessary support for officers to to 
keep themselves both mentally and physically healthy. So it's kind of interesting that we have uh, Building Public Trust as Pillar 1 and Officer Wellness and Safety as 6. To me, those are important bookends for that, that, that influence everything else in that report. Do you want to jump into the questions, Brian, so we have a little more time with those? Sure, uh, we can do that. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to, to quickly mention, and I should have mentioned it up front, is, is you know one of the many reasons why the report of the task force is is important it, it, for the NACOL community is, is really it, it's the first time that civilian oversight had been recommended, uh, you know, as an important mechanism for uh, promoting public trust and, and strengthening the relationship between police and, and communities. Um, so I don't know, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you, uh, I mean, just from um, listening to you know, all of the testimony, uh, you know, the phrase civilian oversight, accountability, transparency, I mean, th those were words that kept coming up and themes that kept coming up in a lot of the testimony that wasn't even necessarily directly related to that sort of to Tracy's point that that all come back to this building trust and legitimacy. So maybe can can the two of you talk how talk about how you arrived at the uh, the specific recommendation and then the two um, follow up action items about civilian oversight. Well, I guess I'll this is Sue. I'll jump in first on this one. One of the things that is frustrating to me is the hue and cry that there's no evidence that civilian oversight is effective. Um, the reason there's no evidence is we haven't figured out the right way to measure the impact of civilian oversight. So I, I would caution people that the, the lack of evidence doesn't indicate a lack of, lack of effectiveness. It indicates our inability to come up with really effective ways to measure it. In terms of, of building trust and legitimacy, the, one of the most important functions of civilian oversight is the belief that people have that there is transparency and accountability. And I think whatever that, however we measure that, the fact that there is a process for that is very, very important. So I'm um, just building on what Sue was saying. You're finished, Sue, right? Because I don't want to interrupt. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we talked about was actually how to understand where civilian oversight fit in the pillars, actually, um, in part because of this issue about, you know, research. So, for example, um, there is, this is not ex civilian oversight. It might sound like what I'm about to say is a little bit orthogonal to that, but um, I hope you'll see where I'm going. There is some research looking at the relationship between diversity of police forces and police use of force, okay? And um, it's very limited research. It's, it's quite weak. But to the extent that it, it does it exist, it suggests that there is very little relationship between diversity of a police force and um, lower uses of, of deadly force. Right. And so some people will look at that and say, oh, well, um, you know, this suggests that diversity of a police force isn't, quote unquote, effective. Um, it's hard for me to do this since none of you can see me using the scare quotes as, as I speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, nonetheless, right, we understand that, you know, regardless of whether that piece of, of evidence ultimately um, ends up being substantiated, and I can understand why the hypothesis would go both ways. Um, there are important reasons having to do with public trust and legitimacy, of course, that a police force represent the demographics, or at least be representative of the demographics of the community in which that force serves. This is one of the issues, um, of course, that uh, was problematic in, uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, and those reasons, of course, have to do with what we understand to be um, the points uh, of the foundation of, of legitimacy, which is related to procedural justice. And what we know that people care about, you know, when they are um, assessing the legitimacy of the agencies that they deal with or 
um, the directives of those agencies or the requests that particular individuals and in those agencies ask them to do, um, we know that people care about being treated with dignity and respect. We know that people look for indicia that decisions are fair, um, and one way you know about the fairness of decisions is that those decisions are transparent and grounded in fact, and you know that they're grounded in fact because the processes by which those decisions are come to are, again, transparent. Uh, we know that people value having an opportunity to participate in the processes that produce these policies at a global level or at an individual level, people value having an opportunity to tell their side of the story. And we know that people look for um, indicia that they can trust the agency or the particular individual that they want to know that that uh, person is going to treat them benevolently in the future. These are the, the four factors of procedural justice that are uh, listed in the interim report and procedural justice itself is um, a, a foundational aspect of legitimacy. And why do I mention that? Well, because when you look at the diversity of police force, you, forces, you can map that factor onto those, um, you know, those aspects of, of procedural justice. And certainly with respect to civilian oversight, you know that uh, civilian oversight processes can easily map onto the theory of procedural justice and that's why we um, emphasize the importance of some form of civilian oversight as a recommendation while at the same time calling for more research so that we could have better information and evidence about which forms work in which particular contexts but also to see ultimately whether those forms of civilian oversight have impacts on particular outcomes that we may also be interested in, um, independent of uh, their effect on procedural justice and legitimacy. And I, I would add to that also, um, you know, looking more closely at the question, what role should oversight play in policing? Uh, that it's going to bring us back to it depends. It depends on the agency, it depends on the community, and it depends on the local government. Again, 18,000 different ways that the community might see this playing out. So I think uh, it's really important to know that two of the recommendations, again, focus on uh, creating more opportunities to, to collect evidence and understand different models, and one of the recommendations is for the COPS office to provide technical assistance to accumulating best practices. So each community ideally would look at um, many different models and be able to look at what model fits best in their community, because this is clearly, in my opinion, uh, a place where one size absolutely doesn't fit all. Great, thank you. So we're we're starting to get a, a number of questions coming in. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to Cami to start moderating the uh, the Q and A from our participants. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Our first question comes from Brian Farrell, and he asks, "How are communities engaging in a review of the task force report and responses to the recommendations?" And he would also like any examples you might have. Hmm. Uh, my answer is I don't know. <laughs> Tracy, <I'm laughs> you have yeah, I don't know either. I, I think I think right now the report is still new enough that um, people are just beginning to dig into it. One of the challenges is the report is very long and it's very dense. Now, there's a lot of information in there, and um, I don't know of any community yet that has really taken a dive into it. Um, I do know that it is being referenced in a number of public yes. discussions, but I, I don't know of any community yet that has taken a very uh, uh, measured approach to, to digging into it. Well, let me, um, you know, uh, um, upon reflection, I, one answer to that question might be something like this. Well, it depends on what you mean by community, right? Good point. So, um, as Sue mentioned, there are definitely places 
where um, the task force is being discussed in a deep and sustained way. So for example, the Northern District of California had a day-long seminar that focused on mostly procedural justice and legitimacy, but the president's task force was a, re recommendations was a centerpiece of, um, of that seminar. Um, similarly, in M March, right after we uh, gave the interim report to the president, um, there was um, a focused meeting on the president's task force um, in all of the federal offices in the state of Illinois. Um, there's going to be another meeting like that in Georgia, um, wherever uh, Atlanta is. Is that the northern district of, of Georgia? I don't, I don't know the federal districts very well. Um, I have heard that, she, uh, that the police commissioner of the New York City Police Department has said it is his intention to implement all of the recommendations. Now, you know, we could, I suppose, call those different groups of people communities, but I don't understand the questioner to be talking about it in that way, so I don't want to, you know, make more of that if that's not exactly what he meant to be asking, or means to be asking. Brian just did um, mention that by communities he was initially thinking of the 18,000 law enforcement agencies. Okay. So New York. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think, I think that the other reality that we need to understand with this is there's, there's very strong political undertones here as well. And uh, something that I experienced uh, earlier this week, I testified in front of the House Committee on the Judiciary. And the, the questions and the uh, tone of that hearing very, was very, very, very partisan. And so that's going to have an impact on how this report is handled in political circles in various communities. Can I mention that, uh, speak to that too? I hope there isn't a, a long line of questions, and if there are, then, you know, Cameron, feel free to, to cut me off here. Um, it's interesting, when we were in Camden uh, with the president, I had a conversation with somebody about precisely that issue, you know, about how we might think about the, the take-up of this issue. And there are moments in time historically where, you know, despite obvious partisanship around certain kinds of issues, there's a kind of right and left convergence on uh, particular issues. So we had one around sentencing reform. Um, you know, that's been a long time now. <laughs> that was in the 80s, and I'm sure people have different views about how effective that was. But there were reasons on both, you know, for lack of a better way of terming it, the right and the left were able to come together. That was true on bail reform. Um, I think the MacArthur Initiative on jails shows that to be true. Um, and, you know, I think the, the, the unfortunately relentless um, exposure of these incidents were of people getting killed uh, by police um, is focusing um, both sides of the aisle on um, this issue. Um, I, I don't think that our recommendations are, are partisan. Um, there, where there is a, potentially an issue, of course, has to do with what the appropriate federal role is in um, implementing these recommendations. And, you know, on that, I urge folks to read the recommendations because the recommendations actually are targeted at the 19,000 um, agencies, 18,000 depending on what you count as an agency. Um, people have different views about what role the federal government should play, but our view as task force members was to recommend a set of best practices that, you know, actually the agencies can and should be implementing themselves. 
And I, I just would like to underscore what Tracy said. The report itself is not partisan at all. In fact, I think it's a, a great example of different different perspectives coming together. Uh, my experience has been that because it's coming from the current administration, all sorts of, of things are being ascribed to it that aren't 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 really fair or accurate. So do we want to forge on with another question? Absolutely. Sue, the next question is directed towards you specifically. Kimberly Hendrickson has written an interesting point about the important differences between East and West Coast policing. Could you elaborate and speak to how these differences might help or hurt reform efforts? Absolutely. And hi, Kimberly. It's nice to hear from you. Um, the, the culture is very, very different. On the East Coast, there is typically um, much larger, the staffing level is typically much higher and some of the culture in my observation is much more traditional in terms of the structure of the agencies and the, and the way that it operates. The, the level of training um, was one of the areas that was surprising to me. On the West Coast, I have observed a much higher level of training um, than on the East Coast, which, which was a bit of a surprise to me. Some of the very large agencies on the East Coast um, I think their training practices are in the same place that the West Coast training practices were a decade ago, and I, I hope I don't get in trouble by saying that, but, but it is a reality that um, was very surprising to me to hear about. Thank you, Sue. Next, Lynn Erickson asks, can you address the issue of police unions and their perceived traditional resistance to reform? Did the task force come up with any recommendations to overcome that and or have a culture shift within the unions to move toward more accountability? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe I should go first um, because I know the least. <laughs> um, you know, Sue, of course, as a longtime sheriff, actually had interactions with police unions. Um, my interaction and knowledge of police unions is much more academic. Um, so the first point to say is that, you know, there was a strong representation of uh, police unions on the task force itself. Uh, one of the 11 members of the task force is Sean Smoot, who um, is the president of the Illinois Police Benevolent, I'm not going to get it right, um, but anyway, the, the, the state, the Illinois State Police Union. Um, he's also the national secretary or treasurer of another large uh, union organization. Um, so it is not as if, you know, people who have that strong perspective were not part of this process to develop these recommendations. Um, so that's the first thing to say. Um, the second thing to say is that if you look at um, the, the testimony, the oral testimony that was given during our process, in which anyone can see, it's public and obvious, you know, it's, it, the, the, the uh, recordings are you can find online. We had many different representatives of different um, union organizations like the Fraternal Order of Police um, testifying at almost every single one of our public listening sessions across the pillars. So it wasn't as if the, uh, the police unions only um, testified, for example, on Pillar 6, officer safety and, and wellness, for example. Um, and um, the third thing to say is, if, if you've watched those recordings, uh, I think it's obvious to anyone that there was some defensiveness um, uh, with respect to the rep some of the representatives of those organizations. You know, so it would be uh, a mistake to pretend like that wasn't the case. It is also true, however, that we had um, union uh, organizers or leadership who were very forthright about their role in making a difference and the kind of change that Sue Rare, Rar, sorry, <laughs> recommends in her Harvard piece. And I'm, I was, I'm actually looking through 
the uh, report right now because I wanted to get his name right, but um, there was a, a, a union representative from um, Sacramento, California, who testified on the very last day uh, of our meetings in D.C. Where is he? I can't find him. Maybe um, you'll remember who he was or who he is, Stu. Um, but one of the things he said, which I thought was really interesting, was he said, look, um, as a union representative, I think we have to um, make the first step. And I actually feel protected in making that stuff because the worst thing that happens to me is I'm no longer um, a, a union representative. I still have my job. And, and, and he, oh, Dustin Smith, he is the president of the Sacramento California Police Officers Association. Um, and he, you know, he went on to say to describe the kind of efforts that he has undertaken in Sacramento, and actually the mayor of Sacramento brought him out. Um, when he testified on the very first day in Washington in January. So, um, you know, I don't know if that's uh, the kind of thing you want to hear. Some of it was just reflecting back your concern about this being a potential hurdle, and I'm acknowledging that to be true, but I'm also trying to point you to, um, you know, places where there has been really strong, distinct leadership from the folks who are leadership in the union on on this issue. And I, I would I would add to that um, one one of the things we talk about in the report and that I talked about in my paper is the concept of internal procedural justice. And frankly, I think when agencies have very strong internal procedural justice, the relationship with the union improves. And we had some very compelling. It wasn't even testimony, it was a citizen comment at the end of our very first hearing where a patrol officer from NYPD stood up and uh, very passionately talked about the fact that the officers working the street had a different perspective about the policing strategies than the leadership. And he said, you know, we don't want to do this heavy-handed zero tolerance. We're being told to do this by our leadership. And so I think sometimes uh, there is a real disconnect between the leadership and the rank and file. And to the degree that we can close that gap and help the street officers feel like they're being supported internally, I think the union is going to be more likely to you know, get on the same page with the leadership. But we also have to understand that every agency is so different. And, and the politics of unions are very widely from one region and from one city to another. So um, there's not a single answer to this, but I think the, the one thing that does apply to all is, is a healthier internal culture um, helps overcome the resistance from the union to accept uh, moving in a new direction. Right. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Beverly Seeley. She writes, I have been hearing from residents in general that the reason civilian oversight by civilian review boards is ineffective is because the civilian oversight entities do not have power or are not given power to operate or make decisions about matters that come before them. How can we use the recommendations to seek uh, cities to, to require cities and towns to ensure power when establishing civilian review boards? Cameron? Um I, it was really hard for me to hear you read that question. Me too. If you could reread it and then read it more slowly, um, that would help. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Beverly Seeley asks, I have been hearing from residents in general that the reason civilian oversight by law by civilian review boards is ineffective is because the civilian oversight entities have no power or are not given power to operate or make decisions about matters that become that come before them. How can the recommendations seek to require cities and towns to ensure power when establishing civilian review boards? I, I'd like to take the first shot at that, and I think this is a fundamental 
uh, problem for civilian oversight is understanding how the civilian oversight role can be most effective. And I think we have to go back to the structure of how policing actually takes place. Police departments don't operate independently. Uh, police chiefs are hired or fired by a mayor or whatever the municipal executive is in that, in that arena. And so there is already a formal uh, political structure of elected officials that set policy. For elected sheriffs, it's a little bit different, obviously, because the sheriffs are elected by the voters in the community. And so those voters have a direct, um, the direct access, so to speak, to the sheriff. So where I think it gets tricky is when you have a civilian oversight board um, wishing to have formal control and power over policies, there is, there, there is no comfortable way or logical way for that to compete with the formal power structures that are already in place. In, in my opinion, in my experience, I think the civilian oversight boards can be more effective if they focus on using their influence and using their voice to uh, get the voters who vote for elected officials who run the police department to give the voters information that they can then, can then exercise um, their rights to, to influence. But I, I think when you get tangled up in who has power and authority, you lose an opportunity to influence. You know, um, I, I, echoing every single thing that um, Sue said but and adding this little twist, which is, um, in many cases, what civilian oversight boards do, are asked to do, is um, to review the decisions of the chief executive to fire someone. So one way of understanding more power might be to say um, that civilian oversight boards should have more input on dictating policy from the front end, well, you know, I think the Los Angeles model is like that. But in a lot of other places, that's not what the Civilian Review Board does. What it does is actually review complaints that individuals make about um, individual officer behavior. And, you know, this is anecdotal, but I, I, I will tell you, having spoken to several police executives, what they say is that in many cases, um, the Civilian Oversight Board actually prevents them from doing what they would like to do <laughs> with respect to um, firing um, officers who misbehave. So I actually don't think that that particular issue is an issue of whether the Civilian Oversight Board has more or less power. It has to do with the ways in which that board understands the role of the police officer differently um, from how the police executive understands it. I, I'd also like to build on that. One, one of my frustrations, and Brian, you will remember some discussions we had at the NACO conference in Seattle. I think a lot of civilian oversight processes focus on the individual officer, right. focus on the bad, the bad apple, so to speak. And I think by only focusing on the apple, you miss the opportunity for the, the process or the factors that have a bit or bigger impact, and that is the barrel itself, the, the culture and the policies of the police department. I think there's much more opportunity for improvement if the civilian oversight expands their focus from individuals to the, the, the policies and processes within the police department. Um, and then you, you can take it another, another layer out and talk about, you know, how the barrel is made. What, what is the, the, the government structure for managing the police department itself? So when, you, when you're only looking at the bad apples, you miss the opportunity for, I think, for preventing future mistakes or misconduct. Thank you to both of you. Let's move. We have time for probably a couple more questions. So let's move to a question by uh, submitted by Louis Zimot. 
Having perused the first three pillars of the report, what considerations were given to the role and responsibilities of citizens in their interactions with law enforcement officers? In terms of what I, I, there's the questioner asking what what recommendations should have been given to citizens for their behavior? My my sense is that that he is wondering about what considerations were given for the responsibilities of citizens in their general interactions and not just the the actions of law enforcement. Um, well, let me take a crack at that. Um, I, I had a similar question to Sue. I, I wasn't exactly sure about what um, Lewis is, is, is asking, but one way of understanding um, that question is to say that the entire first pillar is actually about the relationship between the police and the public. In other words, and understanding that when the police act in a certain way, uh, the public is going to respond in another way, in a particular way. And if police aren't acting in a way that is encouraging trust and confidence, that you know the public won't do that. But there are many other recommendations where we talk very specifically about a dual role of police and members of the community, such as Pillar 4, which is the pillar on community policing, we talk about public safety being a co-production effort um, between police and the community. So in that sense, um, you know, obviously uh, the community or people who are not police officers have a role to play um, in, in, you know, promoting public safety in the neighborhood residents and re where they live. So that's recommendation um, 4.5. Um, we also talk about the ways in which um, both police and members of the public need to affirm and recognize the voices of youth in community decision making. That's not something that police can do on their own. Um, but more importantly, you know, and there were a number of recommendations about youth in school and the like that that um, fit along those lines, that it's not just about police but other institutions. But I, I think the most fundamental thing to recognize is that you don't have public trust without police working with the public. It's not a one-way street. And I, I, I struggle with this question because I, you know, have conversations with a lot of police officers that are very much feeling under fire from the, the public criticism uh, around some of these very troubling events. And I find it difficult to respond to because, you know, we're talking about how to improve policing and so the onus is on law enforcement to figure out how to better engage the public. Uh, individual citizens are already subject to all of the, the laws that are in our communities. And, you know, pragma pragmatically, I don't think there's anything we can do to force people, you know, legally to be, to be more cooperative. I think what we need to do in law enforcement is to be more effective in influencing them to cooperate. But I, I don't think there's any formal mechanism to force people to be more cooperative. You know, you know, keep your hands out of your pocket or keep your hands on your on the steering wheel at a traffic stop. We certainly can do public education, but you know, there comes a point where we can't just continue to pile on new laws. Um, then it just, I think, creates more barriers. So, uh, I, I think we need to keep our focus on law enforcement being more effective at influencing cooperation. Mm-hmm. Thank you. The, the next question is submitted by Tim Fitch. Um, Tim writes, the task force has legitimacy concerns with rank and file police officers since it was appointed by a president that clearly feels law enforcement is the root of many evils. How will these recommendations ever be accepted by those who expect to implement them? I appreciate your work on the task force, but I don't believe this will change anything. 
He then uh, writes further, with that said, I agree with many of the recommendations. I'm the immediate past police chief for St. Louis County, Missouri. Ferguson is in St. Louis County. We have had a front row seat and witnessed many inaccurate representations of what occurred in Ferguson. If you two could speak to that or comment. Uh, what, what, was the, what was the underlying question again? I'm sorry. Yeah. I I, I, I'm sort of stuck on the President Obama thinking that police are the root of all evil, which was a statement, not a question, and also wrong. But. Well, the, his question, um, the port, portion of it that actually has the question mark after it is, how will these recommendations ever be accepted by those we expect to implement? Oh. Given yeah. So I, I can say something about that briefly, and then, Sue, I'm sure you have a lot to say. Um, yeah. We have, um, there were three police executives on four, if you count uh, Sue, um, on our task force. We had a sheriff, we had a public safety commissioner in Cedric Alexander, we have two sitting police chiefs, both of whom, um, I guess we should have re re mentioned uh, Chuck and Taz, Sue, when we were talking about communities that were going to implement them, I am quite confident that Charles Ramsey and Roberto Villasenor in Philadelphia and Tucson, Arizona, respectively, have every intention of implementing the recommendations that we passed since they wholeheartedly supported them. Um, but more than that, we had many, many police executives testify before um, uh, the task force, uh, many of whom both agree with these recommendations and have been implementing them in some way for years. If you think about the folks who served with Sue and me on the Harvard executive sessions on policing and public safety. Um, and it's not just about uh, policing, executive, policing executives. We have uh, district attorneys, we've got federal prosecutors already who have indicated uh, an important interest in doing this. Kamala Harris, the Attorney General of California, has uh, announced an effort to uh, institute statewide training on police legitimacy and procedural justice. And, you know, there are a lot of people who live <laughs> in California. So, um, you know, that's my initial effort. I, I'm not uh, worried that people aren't going to welcome them. I think there are logistical issues and, and trying to get all of this done, but that's a different issue. I, I think one of, one of the biggest challenges we have with this report is the way that some media outlets have, have presented the report. And I've been very frustrated by some of the media coverage because what they focus on to portray in a news story is one very thin slice and it's presented in such a way that it does come across as being overly critical of law enforcement. And I would hope that our police leaders would take the time to read the actual report and not rely on another person's interpretation of the report. The other thing that was very striking to me is my frame of reference about law enforcement is 35 years of working in a law, or 33 years with the sheriff's office where we had a very good police department with very few examples of, you know, corruption and misconduct. Certainly there were some, but it was eye-opening to me to discover that there are other agencies around the country where that is not the case. And the reality of what many people in this country experience with the police is very different than my own personal experience. Uh, Brian Stevenson, who is a civil rights attorney from Alabama, uh, shared many uh, experiences and stories as well as Jose and uh, Brittany Packnett. And I think in law enforcement we have to step back and recognize that there are many different ways of experiencing uh, policing and, and be open to let's, let's just look at ways of improving rather than getting defensive about the criticism is unfair. Yes, sometimes it is unfair but there's also a grain of truth to, to much of it. Can I also, I know that we're running out of time, but 
It, it's interesting. I just want to go back to where we started on um, 6.2 about being unfair to policing because I often find the folks who um, were talking about it being unfair are sometimes um, police executives or union leadership. But again, if you actually talk to the officer on the street, sometimes those folks have a different perspective. And, you know, they say, look, if we actually, if the people who are in charge actually took some of these uh, recommendations seriously, not only is this better for the public, but it's better for me. It makes my yeah, job absolutely. better. Absolutely. <laughs> right? And that's not being anti police. Well, I, I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to end there. Um, there were a number of questions that we were just not able to, to get to, uh, but I think I uh, really appreciate the, the discussion and the, the perspectives and insights that, that both um, uh, Sue and Tracy added. So I would like to uh, thank uh, Sue and, and Tracy for uh, both for their, their work and their service on the, the task force and also for joining us today and sharing their experiences and perspectives and, and insight uh, into their work on the task force and, and policing in, in general. I wanted to thank everyone for their participation today. And just before I turn it over to Cami with some uh, a, a couple of quick uh, closing um, uh, items, I wanted to say, going back to, to Brian's first question about how communities are engaging with the, the task force report, I, I think, you know, it's uh, this is a great opportunity for you to take the report and their recommendations uh, to leaders in policing and local government and oversight and in the community, uh, you know, to have these conversations and to have these dialogues and to talk about um, what your community can do to uh, discuss, um, uh, go through the, the report and recommendations and, and implement them to fit in, in your community. So I think that this is uh, sort of a great call to action uh, that the task force really left us with, um, you know, based on the insight and experience of, of everyone uh, who provided testimony, uh, you know, to them. And so I think that this is a, a great opportunity for the nation and our individual communities to, to begin to move things forward. So uh, thank you again to Sue and Tracy, and thanks to, to all of you. Um, and uh, we look forward to further engagement with, uh, with you on a lot of the issues that were covered in the task force report. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Enjoy talking to you all. Thank you again, everyone, for attending today's session and, and for taking a moment to complete the on long online survey that will be sent to you shortly. Our webinar series still has several exciting topics to address later this year. In July, we'll be talking about body-worn cameras and the policies needed to make them most effective. And in September, we'll be discussing the how-tos of an innovative mediation program. Please watch your inbox for additional information about these webinars, including dates and when registration will be open. We once again thank you for joining us today and we can, as we continue bringing together individuals and agencies working to establish or improve oversight of police officers in the United States.